The city of Boston has a rich history from being a Native American settlement to hosting a colonial tea party and the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence. It was also the location for some of the infamous witch trials held in the 17th century along the northeast coast of the United States. Across the river from Boston lies the town of Cambridge, which houses two of the world's most renowned universities, MIT and Harvard. And Harvard Square is where I am now, the intellectual hub of the city. It was the scene of one Harvard professor's fight for academic freedom and what was described at the time around a decade ago as a modern day witch hunt to remove this man from his post. The professor was a psychiatrist called John E. Mack. His chosen subject was alien abductees or, as they like to be known, experiences. I had a thing on my bed that looked like an insect with like a big overgrown bug with a stick-like neck that looked biomechanical in nature and big liquid black wraparound eyes and didn't look anything like I had ever seen. Like I'm getting chills thinking about it. And then what happens is it feels like the body's molecules excite to this intense degree that we would become something like light or like, you know, heat. There's no movement. That's terrifying. You really feel like you're being communicated to. You just hear it in your mind. And what I realized was that I've actually been having these experiences since childhood. And then you end up in this place, God forbid that we actually call it a ship. I can't even say it with a straight face. The rooms are very curved, it's very quiet. Then there's a whole other experience that includes a medical exam, that includes interfacing with these beings, and sometimes includes interfacing with other human beings. The beings would show images of the earth being destroyed. The whole thing is absurd. That doesn't mean it's not happening. In the early 1990s, John Mack, an eminent Harvard psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, began investigating people who said that they were in contact with extraterrestrial life. Even though the X-Files had yet to be broadcast, meeting E.T. is a popular theme in entertainment, and a belief in UFOs was, as it remains now, something of a phenomenon. Around four million Americans, for instance, claim to have been abducted by aliens. But what upset the academic establishment of Harvard even more than John Mack's decision to tackle the subject in the first place was that this highly respected professor and Pulitzer Prize winner took what the abductees were reporting extremely seriously. These people, as far as I could tell, were of sound mind, had not communicated with each other, were not getting details from the media. This was long before the great media rash of information on this subject. They were reluctant to come forth and they described similar stories in great detail and were shocked when they would hear that someone else had had a similar experience. And the only thing as a psychiatrist that I knew that behaved like that was real experience. To the embarrassment of Harvard, John Mack's research into alien abductees or experiences became highly public and the professor became something of a celebrity. But Mack paid a personal price by giving such a controversial area academic scrutiny he almost lost his job. This is the story of that struggle from those who were closest to John Mack. Unfortunately, he died in a car accident last autumn, but we can still hear his side of the battle with Harvard from archive recordings. What are the other possibilities? Dreams, for instance. Dreams do not behave like that. Dreams are highly individual. One dreams according to what's going on in your unconscious at that particular time in the dreams of one person are quite different from those of another, or some kind of trauma, for instance, like sexual abuse, which is often raised. I would never say, yes, there are aliens taking people. I would say there is a compelling, powerful phenomenon here that I can't account for in any other way that's mysterious. There isn't a single case of an alien abduction story that fulfills my criteria that has turned out to be anything else, and yet I can't know what it is. But it seems to me it invites some kind of deeper, further inquiry. Most people would agree that the abduction scenario lies in the realm of science fiction. 
Those who claim to be an unwilling part of this often speak of being surrounded by strange-looking beings and, more disturbingly, sometimes forcing them into sexual encounters to produce hybrid human-alien offspring. I met two of Max abductee case studies, Karen Austin and Peter Faust, in the suburbs of Boston. Not surprisingly, when their experiences first began, they each thought they were going crazy. Have I ever questioned my own sanity? Absolutely. I mean, every day, you know, to a certain degree, because the majority of the world says that you're crazy for having this experience. But if it was just me who had contact with aliens, who had intimate experiences or mating experiences with female aliens and then producing some type of offspring, I would say I'm certifiable. Put me away. I'm crazy. But then when I began to look at the experience outside myself and realized that hundreds if not thousands of people, both men and women, report the exact same experience, it gave me a sense of sanity. I couldn't be making this up. I couldn't be fantasizing this. I think the thing that was most convincing for me was, was the fact that there was always a physical component. I would wake up the next day after certain experiences with cooperating marks on my body and one final experience happened fully physically, fully in my room, on my bed, with my fiancé sleeping next to me. And I was totally awake for it, like, I'm awake here speaking with you now. And at that point, I stopped fighting about whether or not it was real. And I just accepted it and thought, OK, I'm going to move forward in the rest of my life, recognizing that there's something out there that we don't understand. John Mack began his career specialising in the psychology of sleep and dreams. He gained an international reputation as an expert in child and adult psychoanalysis and the misunderstood or vulnerable, especially children contemplating suicide. As well as these solid and impressive academic credentials, friends and colleagues considered him adventurous, always asking questions that others didn't ask. Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry Robert J. Lifton worked with Mac at Harvard and was a close personal friend for many years. I would point to his earlier work, prior to his work with UFOs, as an expression of his adventurousness. His work on T.E. Lawrence, which was really the work of both a scholar and a romantic. He became fascinated with T.E. Lawrence from watching the famous film about him, Lawrence of Arabia, and took off to Europe to study him. It was an enormously adventurous and unconventional thing to do. Mack's research into the psychiatric dimensions of Lawrence's personality resulted in the book A Prince of Our Disorder. It earned him the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 1977. Perhaps it was no surprise then that John Mack should venture into the realm of alien abduction. I wasn't entirely surprised because I knew... John well enough to recognize that he would take some unconventional path and that this adventurousness would contribute to it. Did you think it was a good idea, though, for his academic career? Neither he nor I worried about his academic career in terms of that step. It was something he had to do. He was an accomplished clinician, was known as an excellent therapist and clinically very astute. And his first findings were in the spirit of a clinician who was interviewing people who had special experiences that were hard to explain. But as he got into it, he became, as he understood it, part of something larger. And that became a larger visionary and spiritual idea and quest, much more than a mere scientific study. John Mack's interest in people's belief systems had taken him and his family all over the world. I, I love this photo here. Yeah, black it, black in later one. life, he would meet Yasser Arafat and the Dalai Lama. And in his early 30s, yeah. he went to live and work in Japan. That's, in a little kimono. That's right, that's Danny. Sally Mack was married to John for 36 years. She's a social worker specialising in family crises and has also worked on child abuse programmes and with adult post-trauma reactions. Her understanding of her husband's decision to work on alien abduction experiences was both personal and professional. John always asked questions that nobody else asked. It irritated him that people were passive about, oh, this is what we're supposed to believe. Oh, good, we all believe it, you know. 
he didn't accept that. His work on these experiences, did he see that as simply yet another professional challenge? Originally, he was just curious about it. The first person who told him about it, he said, oh my goodness, they've got to be crazy. And the people who believe them and are interviewing them have really got to be crazy. This friend said, well, just give it a chance. Just talk to them. And I remember he came home and said, 